This is one billion dollars. But it's also a lesson for our US government not to follow in the footsteps of other governments and print more money so that this one billion dollars actually exists, whose value is not even worth the paper that this is printed on. Believe it or not, in 2020 alone, we had one bank fail. But in just the last three years, since the beginning of 2017, we've had 13 banks fail and shut down completely. And that means if you held your money in one of those banks, you could have potentially lost a lot of money. And this is especially a scary thought considering everything else that's going on in the world with the health crisis, which has now unfortunately become a financial crisis as well as more and more companies start to shut down and lay people off. In fact, I made a video about this recently where most of my immediate family was affected by this last round of layoffs. And that makes me really sad. Not for myself, but mostly for my friends and my family. And if things could not get worse, the stock market is also in free fall, including my very own investments, which I've held in Robinhood, which at the peak were worth roughly $210,000, $220,000, and right now are worth roughly $142,000. So I'm right there with you, I'm feeling the pain as well. But I imagine most people keep their money in the bank, including myself. And that really prompts the question, is our money really safe in the bank right now, or should we go all in. Hi, my name is Andre Jick, and the world still seems to be on fire. Never gets old. But just recently, I got a lot of questions of people asking, Andre, is our money really safe in the bank right now? Because just recently, the Federal Reserve has announced the all infamous infinite money glitch. It's kind of like this. Yes, free money, infinite money glitch. Who doesn't want that? Have you ever played Command and Conquer Red Alert Retaliation on PlayStation 1 back in the days? I still remember the money glitch. It's square, square, circle, X, triangle, circle. <laughs> Except in the video game, there's no real consequences, but IRL, in real life, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Unless you do the fire wallet, then you'll get a free lunch. Maybe it's my contingency plan. But what this means is that we're about to enter a new phase of something called quantitative easing, which kind of sounds like time traveling in a sci-fi movie. And I'm sure you've heard that word before in the simplest way that I can describe exactly what it is because it's extraordinarily complicated is that the government is about to use debt to pay off debt. It's kind of like taking a credit card and then shifting the debt and then paying off one credit card with the other. I'm a genius. I haven't really paid off my debt. I just shifted it from one credit card to the other. Task failed successfully. Now in the short term, this should in theory help the economy grow with the Fed and the government injecting more liquidity into the economy. And the way to think about liquidity is it's kind of like the oil to the engine of a car. Without the oil, the engine is not gonna run properly. So by injecting more money into the system, it allows for people to continue exchanging money, continue lending, continue borrowing. And without that, if there's too much panic and fear in the market and everybody pulls out and there's no money in the system, it's gonna come to a grinding halt just like it would in the engine of a car. So with the Fed and the government injecting more money into the system, hopefully the idea is that it will prevent the economy from coming to a complete standstill. In addition to that, the government has announced 0% interest rates, which in theory is great because that makes car loans, home loans, student loans, all much easier to pay with the exception of credit card interest rates because that's where banks and credit card companies make a lot of money. But this also means that as interest rates fall, the price of assets tend to go higher. And the reverse is also true. As interest rates climb, the price of assets tend to fall, which is kind of like dating. It's when you chase somebody and they're like, no, I don't want you. And they're like, fine, I don't want you back. And then they start chasing you. It's unhealthy, but basically that's how it works. And this actually makes sense because for example, if you wanted to buy a home right now because interest rates are basically nothing and it's cheap to borrow money, there's more competition in the housing market, which means home prices go higher. Hence, interest rates low, asset values go higher, which is also why I'm on the fence about buying a house right now and I'm torn between financing and just waiting for home prices to come down, but that's the trade-off that we have to make. Stock markets also tend to climb higher as interest rates fall especially as the Fed buys corporate debt, which is this new trick that they're trying, which kind of makes me wish that they'd buy my parents' debt instead. Might be more useful, but if you're an investor during this time, then in theory, you should be making more money. So it all sounds good, right? We're on the road to recovery. Well, yes, but no. Because the people who truly pay for this 
are the future generations. The people who really pay for this stuff are future versions of you and I. It's like my Uncle Ben used to say, with great money comes great inflationability. It's also why boomers like to say things like, well, back in my day, I bought a home when I was 18 years old for $10,000, you lazy millennials. Because our lifestyle is becoming increasingly more and more expensive as corporations pass on those costs to the customers, raising prices for goods and services because of inflation, which is because the government is printing free money. But when it comes to this sort of stuff, few people really understand what is going on because it's very complicated. But for those that do understand are kind of split down the middle between thinking, yes, this is a necessary thing for the government to step in and potentially save us from a larger crisis. In other words, we should be bailed out by the government because the government should do its job so that we don't lose ours permanently. We should protect our 401ks, our IRAs, our insurance plans, our pensions, because we don't wanna go back to the dark ages we actually want to retire peacefully, and that makes sense. Put simply, the government right now is like a parent who's sending their kid money. He's not the smartest kid in the world, but he loves you with all his heart, and would you really let him starve and live homeless on the streets? It's a caring move, but maybe that's exactly what the kid needs. He needs to fail so that he can learn to live on his own without relying on his parents for help. It's going to hurt, but maybe that's exactly what he needs. And there's another significant portion of the population who's completely against the idea of any sort of bailouts, who's completely against quantitative easing or ZERPs, zero interest rate policies, calling for the complete collapse of the system so we can finally hit the reset button and start this economy from scratch. Think of these people kind of like Thanos. The hardest choices require the strongest wills. And that's typically the divide that you will see amongst the American population of people that actually follow all of this nerdy financial stuff, but most people simply just don't care. So if you're one of the few people who's still watching this YouTube video, then you're ahead of most people in the world. But one thing is true, and that is there is nothing anyone can do about this. No matter how much we talk about it, discuss it, debate it, none of us will have an influence on any of these policies. But at least what you should know is that the more money you have uninvested right now, the less valuable it becomes in the future as the rising tide lifts all boats. And if you're not in the water, you're gonna miss all the free floaties that the government is throwing at people. And I want my free floaty. So I'm not gonna sell anything and I'm gonna continue to stay in the market. Also fun fact, this is why Bitcoin was created. You might've heard of it. It's a digital cryptocurrency, 21 million of them in existence, was worth nothing at some point. Then some guy bought 10,000 Bitcoins worth of pizza, which at the time was worth about $30. And then at its peak, each Bitcoin was worth $20,000. Yeah, imagine being that guy. I was once almost a billionaire. Yes, that Bitcoin, and it was created specifically to fight the government's ability of centrally controlling our monetary supply so that instead we can rely on a money that was more governed by the laws of mathematics and computers rather than controlled by a central entity that was able to just print money out of thin air, kind of like right now, robbing you and I of our savings rate, which is why in the short term, I could totally see the price of gold and things like Bitcoin go up at least in the short term. Also, I don't wanna scare anyone by saying things that create unnecessary fear, panic, and drama, but the media doing its thing is saying that this coming recession is gonna make 2008 look like a small blip on the map. And that's a scary thing to say, considering that in 2008, the unemployment rate went as high as 8.1%, peaking at 9.9% .9 in 2009. But in 2020, the upcoming recession, they're saying the unemployment rate could go as high as 20%, which is twice as bad as 2008. Just think about that twice as bad. Because in 2008, I remember that I was just graduating from high school and seeing all this going on around me, I didn't really care and none of it affected me because I wasn't investing at the time, I wasn't looking for a job and none of it really affected me. The only thing I cared about was just going to college reluctantly just to please my parents and sad at the same time to see all of my friends going out of state to get themselves into mountains of debt. But for everyone else, it was a terrifying year because that year alone, people lost value in their 401ks, their IRAs, their HSAs, they lost their health insurance, they lost their pension plans, their homes, and everything in between. It was scary. But just for context, in 2008 alone, we had 25 banks fail and go out of business. But in 2009, the following year, just one year later, 
guess how many banks we had go out of business because I'm guessing your numbers are way off. I'll give you just a second to think about it because in 2009, we had 140 banks fail and go out of business. And you can even fact check my numbers by going to fdic.gov forward slash bank forward slash individual forward slash failed forward slash bankless dot html. That's a mouthful. So given everything that's going on in the world right now, just how much cash should we have to prevent us from going into complete disaster? And if we do decide to keep it in the bank, just what would it take for the banking system to collapse? And if it does, what would it take for us to get our money back? And how long would that take? And what is the process even like? These are all questions that keep me up at night along with this magic trick. I have no idea how that works. Still trying to figure it out. So first, let's all take a breather. I'm gonna show you right now exactly how to prepare during these uncertain financial times. But I do wanna remind you that this is getting into the territory of personal finance, and it's called personal finance for a reason because it's public. No, it's personal and it will vary from person to person. There's no one size fits all approach, but there is a loose guideline that you and I can follow to figure out exactly how much money we should have. And also, no matter which method you choose to use, they all start with a budget, which is just a fancy word of saying you need to keep track of how much money you are making versus how much money you are spending. Now you could do this by downloading an app like Mint or Personal Capital. And once you've downloaded something to keep track of your money, you can use a method called the 50-30-20 rule, which is a fancy way of tracking your income and putting it into different categories of your life. For example, 50% of your income should be things like fixed costs. And for me, that's things like my rent, my internet, my phone bill, my gym membership, which I just canceled because I'm not about to be paying $90 for a gym that's closed. Okay. Adobe Creative Cloud to edit my videos and to some extent my utilities. Now all of those bills should be accounting for no more than 50% of my income. Another 30% of your monthly income can be allocated fancy word that nobody ever uses in a real world conversation into discretionary spending. And this includes restaurants, grocery bills, charitable contributions, and or things like Yeezus. No, you don't really need Yeezys, so let's move on. The other 20% is your retirement accounts. This is your IRAs, your Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, your 401ks, your HSAs, anything to do with retirement goes here. You can also use this 20% to allocate into building an emergency fund or three to six months of expenses or nine months if you really want to be conservative during tough economic times like we're in right now. Now you should be able to do this two to six months in advance in case you lose your job and that's how much cash you should have. But if you don't trust the banks and you think they're gonna fail for whatever reason, then you can have literal cash sitting in your vault at home and that's how much money you should have. But just remember that by having cash, you're taking on a different type of risk of people maybe breaking in and stealing your money. So just keep that in mind. But Thankfully, this is not real, so <laughs> don't come knocking. But this brings us to the most important question of the day, and that is, what would it take for the banks to crash right now? And is your money safe right now? Because it is highly unlikely that the financial banking system would crash as a result of everything going on, because this crisis is not a financial crisis like it was in 2008. Right now, the banking restrictions and rules are a lot tighter than they used to be in 2008, even though the Federal Reserve right now is making them more loose. So if we do see a banking system failure, it probably won't come until many years from now, but it might be as a result of how we're dealing with the situation today. But that's a story for another time. There is, however, one way that the banks could fail today, and that is if everyone lost faith in the entire system and thought it was just like a Rick and Morty episode where everything went to zero and the dollar was worthless, then we might be in trouble. And there's quite a few people who believe this, just check some of my YouTube comments on this video and some of my previous videos and you'll see there's quite a few people who believe this. I'm so smart. I was right. I told you so. Invested in gold, got my cash, got my ammo, and I'm a charging my laser. Then in that case, we could potentially have an all-out failure of the banking system, which is why the government decided to step in and do quantitative easing, pump more money into the system, and offer 0% interest rates by spurring more economic activity so people don't freak out. So if you want to be sane and level-headed, you could look at this and say, well, then it's a good thing that the government stepped in to prevent a potentially really bad thing from happening in the future. 
Or you could look at it from a more objective, capitalistic way and say, well, this is a really bad thing because you're not allowing the economy to grow. It's a dog eat dog world and companies should be allowed to fail. Otherwise, you're encouraging irresponsible government behavior and corporate bad habits. But that depends on how you wanna look at it, which is a choice only you can make. Still, if you have rich people problems like some of my friends here on YouTube, then you should not keep more money than the maximum allowed insured limit, which will vary country to country. So for example, if you're in Canada, then your CDIC limit is up to $100,000, which I believe at this time is around $20 US. <laughs> but for the US, we have the FDIC insurance limit, which protects our money up to 250,000 US dollars. It used to also be $100,000, but after the 2008 debacle, we were increased up to $250,000 and have since just kind of stayed there. And that's how much money will be insured and protected in case any given bank fails. And for anyone who has heard that the FDIC can take up to 99 years to give you your money back, that is 100% a myth and it is false. In case your bank fails, the FDIC will kick in and will usually give you your money back the next business day. In fact, true story, most people will usually not even notice that their bank fails because all that happens is your money gets to stay put in one place and the bank gets renamed to something else. And that's just the facts and I'm saying it like it is. So if you're wealthy and you have the luxury of doing this, then keep your money in the house with cash in a vault somewhere if you feel like it's secure enough. Just make sure that you have enough cash to pay for a few months of expenses, maybe even a year if you feel really conservative. Otherwise, there's nothing wrong with keeping your money in the bank as long as it's spread out across different accounts in FDIC insured banks to where you feel like the logistical nightmare of tracking different accounts in multiple banks is enough to protect your investment. But bottom line, don't keep your money all in one place and have your money invested across diversified resources like real estate, stocks, REITs, dividend stocks, index funds, maybe bonds, have some gold and perhaps invest it into uncorrelated assets like Bitcoin because you wanna secure your ticket to the moon. If we ever finish building that rocket ship, you don't wanna miss the moon landing. Just make sure that you don't invest more than 10% of your net worth into that one. Don't forget to open your account with Webull, fund it any dollar amount, get one free stock valued up to $1,400, open an account with Robinhood, get another free stock, and remember to remain calm. Everything won't be all right, man. Seriously, I'm so happy to be back in the States. I'm happy to report that everyone is safe. I'm excited to finally help my family get back on their feet. Enjoy your week. Love you all, lovely people, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye-bye. Shoo!